Even men at the top of their game find themselves wanting more from life, whether it's more meaning, unshakable confidence, a bigger impact, more money, deeper love, a hotter sex life, or a powerful legacy. Find out how good your life can be on this episode of Man Alive. Also, as I've supported men in their love and work lives for 15 years now, many men ask for the right words to say to be more successful, attractive, and desirable. But I found it's not so simple as giving scripts or lines because every man is different. So giving words or scripts would be like giving a tall, thin man a shorter, wider man's pants or vice versa. The words have to make sense for you and your personality, and there's so much happening beneath the surface that people are responding to. If you're interested in how to become a better lover and leader in your own unique way, go to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz, or you can text ALIVE to 44144. It only takes a couple minutes and you'll start to get an idea of how you can be both more respected and desired. After you fill it out, we can schedule a time to review your quiz and talk about your specific challenges and desires. So again, go to either shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text ALIVE to 44144. That's A-L-I-V-E to 44144. Enjoy this episode of Man Alive. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Man Alive. I'm your host, Shana James, and I'm excited to be here today to talk about something that most of us, I think, don't tend to think of, which is a psychological love life. And our guest today, Dr. Thomas Jordan, welcome, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, wrote a book called Learning to Learn to Love, Guide to Healing Your Disappointing Love Life. And I really... <laughs> You know, it's sad to say, and it makes me laugh a little bit, just I think that kind of uncomfortable laugh where so many of us have been disappointed in love and really looking at how to turn that around and in a practical way, you know, um, there are many, many books and many, many theories out there and a lot of work we can do. And so I'm excited to see that you have created a very practical guide for people to actually learn how to love and be satisfied in their love life. So I know that you've been a clinical psychologist, a psychoanalyst, and NYU postdoc for you know around 35 years. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of why you wrote this book and how you came to it? Well, first and foremost is I changed my own love life. Ah. <laughs> what was happening? Walk the walk. That you, yeah, what was happening before, and how did well, you? Well, I I was I was struggling with a disappointing love life, mm -hmm. you know, and. Uh, I'd say between the ages of 17 and 35, I was uh, repeating disappointment over and over. Yeah. So uh, an astute analyst here in New York City pointed out to me that I was using what my mother had taught me as a template for my love life, and it this wasn't working good. very well. And that, <laughs> that notion yeah. just knocked me out a little, and I, mm -hmm. I had to go inside and take a look at what that means, you know. Yeah. So uh, I made some changes because my mother taught me that eligible women were uh, self-centered, uh, controlling, and dependent. And those are features that she struggled with in her life, uh, throughout yeah. her life. And so when I was able to look at that and and consider the alternatives, which were, you know, independent people who could be intimate and not controlling, yep. I began to discover a broader sense of eligibility, so to speak. And uh, as a consequence, a few years later, I met my wife and she mm. and I have been married for 28 years. She's an independent, independent, intimate, not controlling person. So there you uh, go. <laughs> I love that. Independence and intimacy, right? In, and intimate. There's a balance of that kind of sovereignty and autonomy and the capacity uh -huh. to be close. Absolutely. And absolutely. And so that's number one. And I wanted to see if I could translate that. Uh, experience I had into something that people could read and begin to connect with their own issues and begin the process of becoming conscious, mm -hmm. which is always the first step to change, yep. becoming conscious of what they were, what their disappointment consisted of. The second one was how many people I saw in my office over the years that had love life struggles. And yes. uh, I began to take notes on it because I, I was seeing so much repetition. Yep. And that's a big idea you know that's how we identify first and foremost that something is in control of our love lives instead of ourselves yes. and when learning is unconsciously learned 
and most learning about love relationships is, in my mm -hmm. belief, unconsciously mm -hmm. learned in the first classroom, so to speak, not exclusively, but a lot. Yeah. You know, the family of origin, the first classroom right? of the family of origin, absolutely. Right? <laughs> yeah. And we we learn by being in relationships with people in the family and how we're treated, for example. Mm -hmm. We can learn by observation of relationships among family members. Mm -hmm. and there's even instruction that can take place from time to time. You know, you should marry a person like this. And, and you know, this is the model for who you should marry. I remember my father saying something like that to us when my brothers and I were young. I hope you guys find a woman like your mother. When you uh, when you get old enough to get married, I mean, I'm like eight years old in this wow. scenario and wow. learning something about love relationships in that moment. Yeah. So I was seeing this occur, and I was seeing the the um, the 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 unlinked. I'm going to use that word unlinked. Understand uh, lack of understanding between what people had learned earlier in life and how they were repeating unhealthy relationship experiences in their mm -hmm. lives. And I saw so much of that. And there's such a tragedy involved in that, because yeah. if you do enough of that, you get to resignation. And I talk about that in my book. And it's really a stage where people give up on love and yes. they figure it's just more disappointment, more yeah. hurt. Why did yeah. why do it? You know? Yeah. I've seen a lot of that, right? That sense of resignation and why do it? And it just seems like it will eventually be painful. I know one of my, right. Right. one of my, uh, unconscious statements that became conscious at one point was that relationship is just a slow slide into hell, right? oh. a slow, a slow uh -oh. slide into <laughs> disconnection and disappointment and heartache. And, and I, you know, once I saw that, I was like, Oh, that is not the story I want to hold anymore. And how do I actually, right. I had to, I had um, to shift that and change that and see what would it take. So absolutely. Like and if I could be an book. analyst for a moment, you know, the word hell is a wonderful symbol for the things in our unconscious that are painful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, you know, the, the thought of sliding into unconscious repetitive patterns that end up being disappointing and painful. That's yeah. the basis of resent, uh, uh, resentment, resignation. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's not easy to, uh, to stay out of being jaded or resigned when we don't see power, you know, powerful examples of positive relationships. And when we don't have the tools. So I think that's uh -huh. what you and I are both here to attempt to do, right? To support yeah. people to have the tools and Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So you got into this through your own personal love life and through your clients. I have the same uh -huh. experience. Uh -huh. And what would you say like what is the foundation of a disappointing love life? I mean, I know you just said, right, these unhealthy patterns and things that we learn in the first classroom, but can you expand a little bit so that people yeah, can get absolutely. a sense of that? Yeah, the three uh, concepts that I use to understand the disappointing love life and how it evolves and basically takes over a love life mm -hmm. when it's left uh, without understanding or without consciousness. Uh, number one we mentioned is repetition. Yeah, And when people look into their love lives to see if something's in control of it, uh, that's the first sign. If you see repetitive patterns taking place, and I listed in the book 10, I now have 12 unhealthy relationship experiences that I saw uh, that were reoccurring in people's love lives, abandonment, wow. abuse, control, neglect, um, dis dishonesty. These are relationship patterns I kept seeing over and over again. So I listed them and I was really kind of looking to see how they would get uh, replicated in people's love lives. And that's the second idea that helps understand a disappointing love life, that the unconscious learning that we've attained is in the back room, so to speak. And it's uh, that learning is responsible for shaping our love life experience. And the shaping takes place in the form of replicating mm -hmm. experiences. Um, and it uh, it's amazing how, and the, uh, into the third concept would be how we recreate those replicating experiences. So the thing about it is that it's not just an unconscious experience that's going on without our awareness. We're unconsciously creating the very experience that's causing us trouble. Yes. Um, for example, can't tell you so how many people, blowing. I'm sorry, I, I can't tell blowing. you how many, yeah, the, the, the creativity, the unconscious creativity in it is a very powerful notion, you know, yeah. scary, scary, scary and mm -hmm. powerful. You know, the the extent to which people have told me in clinical work 
things like I was abandoned by my father and I tend to find unavailable men, yeah, yeah. emotionally unavailable men. My mother cheated on my father. So I find women who cheat on me. Yeah. I mean, and you can you can find someone who recreates this unhealthy experience with yeah. you, or you can recreate it yourself with them. It can go either way. I've even met people that alternate, have one relationship where they're treated badly and, and the next relationship, they treat the person badly. So it, <laughs> when it's dominating, when the disappointing love life is dominating in this way, it's really, it can move in a certain individual pattern per person. I, in the book and in my work, I, I wanted to look into that learning, that unconscious learning as deeply as I could. So I look for unconscious beliefs. Mm -hmm. For example, if people have repetitive disappointment of a particular kind, they begin to believe somewhere in the back room, all men cheat. Yeah. All women are going to be controlling. Yeah. You know, these stereotypic, all people are going to do this or that. I think indicates an unconscious belief that sits oh, in the course. back, structuring expectations, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, the second item is behavior, as I as I mentioned about what we gravitate toward. I remember a, a woman I had in my office a long time ago. She struggled with getting out of relationships with uh, unhealthy alcoholic men, a lot of males who are un, unhealthy and alcoholic in her family of origin. So she's cleared of that. And we're having a moment of lightness between the two of us. And I said, if I had a party with 50 eligible men mm -hmm. and one alcoholic, and there wasn't a drop of alcohol at that party, would you be talking to him by the end of the night? She started laughing. She goes, I have radar for these guys. Yeah, and, and, and it might happen without awareness. And the mystery of it is really something. The last item in the learning, looking at learning, is feeling, the mm. familiarity of feeling. And by the way, feel, uh, familiarity is the, the root of the word is family, family, yes, family. So when a feeling is familiar, if we've had an abandonment, for example, which is a powerful and extreme example, but it's, it, it'll illustrate, if we've yeah. had an abandonment in, in the family of origin, and that's gotten into our love lives. Uh, the feeling that accompanies abandonment obviously is lost. So what yeah. happens is when you look into a person's adult love life, you see repeated, replicated experiences of loss of over and over again. It's a familiar feeling that goes with how replications are being recreated in a person's love life. So it's a little bit scary becoming aware that we're doing this behind yes. the curtain, so to speak. But the good news is it empowers a person to make changes. I was changes. just going to say, right? We can't be empowered to change if we're not conscious or not aware Absolutely. of what's happening. Right. Yeah. But it is th those moments where people first become aware of those patterns and habits can be very rough. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I uh, In the book, and you mentioned it briefly a, a few minutes ago, there are defenses mm -hmm. that people use that sometimes mm -hmm. complicate becoming aware of this type of thing that we're talking about. Uh, and defenses can go all the way from, uh, you know, trying to be in love relationships at a distance, um, trying to, um, you know, uh, generate conflict so you can be in control and not mm -hmm. vulnerable mm -hmm. or uh, just avoiding relationships altogether or keeping them limited. Yeah. And the ways in which they're kept limited are interesting too, because one of them is that I see a lot of is people who get together with someone who isn't exactly who they want, but they say to themselves, I'll love you to death and change you. Uh huh. I know you got it in you. It'll I know come you got out it in over you. time. I can right. see your potential. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. And then, of course, there's the substituting people as you look for the per perfectly 100% compatible partner. Okay, you're not good enough next. You're not good enough next. You're not good enough next. And as a consequence, you have this superficial love life where you're looking for what you're not going to find, basically. Yeah. And then but there's what do you the, say to that? What do you say to someone who's looking for that hundred percent? And you and I both know nobody's going to be that hundred percent, but you also want to have enough there, right? That that is a match. How do you work with people with that? Well, um, the first thing you have to do, I believe, is get their attention. Mm -hmm. Get their attention means to become aware of the fact that what they're doing is causing 
disappointment and the hurt that comes with disappointment. Disappointment is a little bit of a technical word, but it's got an emotion embedded in it. And that is hurt, loss, you know? So once you get a person's attention in this way, I think you can begin to introduce the idea that you're never going to find a perfect person, that perfection Mm -hmm. is not something on the planet Earth, maybe Mm -hmm. on another planet somewhere. But uh, having that govern your love life is going to produce misery. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a little bit of a process of convincing someone that there's a a better way and the better way involves. um, I'm going to put it in a sentence that I always love. Uh, Someone, an old friend of mine said, The trick about love life is to find someone whose faults you can live with. (laughs) Yes. So that that notion is a notion that you introduce to this person who's into substituting, looking for perfection, that it's really about finding people whose faults you can live with, you know, and if you can't live with them, then move on, find someone who you're comfortable with, who shows their human element to you. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be perfect, but you'll have a chance at having a real human intimacy and interaction. I want to also mention that there's a fad now called, I think the word for it is polyamorous relationships, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where you have multiple partners. Yeah. Now, you don't believe in that because you're calling well, it a fad. Um, I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't put it exactly like that. I mm-hmm. see the defensive potential in it. Yes. I think it's basically limited intimacy. Yeah. So my mind, and, and this is my own bias, I'm thinking of why is this person avoiding vulnerability? Mm. Well, which, right. I mean, I think that um, speculates that they are avoiding vulnerability, which I think can happen. I do know people who have polyamorous or open relationships that are very intimate and very deep. And I think it can be an easy way to escape that ah. intimacy. <laughs> Big word, escape. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So see, I would, when you use the word intimate, I would I would throw question marks at that word when you use it the first time. I, I, I think that there can be we can see we can feel like something's intimate, but it's not really intimate. Mm. In my mind, you can't have intimacy without vulnerability. Oh, of course. Yes, I totally agree with that. Can you say more about what when would we think it's intimate without it actually being intimate? Uh sex. There are many people that associate sex with intimacy. Right. Just the fact now, of having it versus just the facts of having being it. Right, connected and vulnerable. Right. right. Mm-hmm. I uh sex is a wonderful gymnastic activity. Mm-hmm. It's a, a wonderful social activity. Mm-hmm. Uh it's best when two people love each other. Yeah. I I believe. I'm old school in that way. Mm-hmm. Um and uh um when you're there just for sex. Um, I'm not going to judge it to Mm -hmm. consensual partners. Perfect. Everything's cool. But there's more intimacy than that available. More possible available. Absolutely. So I kind of put it on a continuum. Yeah. And sex in a love relationship, in love relationship, that is the most exalted experience humans can have with each other in this world. Yeah. Yeah, it truly is amazing the intimacy possible. And it is one of the most vulnerable ways right we're being naked physically emotionally you know our souls are open to each other so it makes sense to me that that would be some of those moments where people would defend or protect oh yeah absolutely right Uh uh-huh do you have a way of um putting words i often have a hard time putting words to what's possible right like you just said exalted and i i feel that and i i recognize that and i often have a hard time describing that experience to someone who hasn't had it uh yeah right Um, (laughs) mm, that's a big one (laughs) um right um that's a problem that does not go away easily Mm -hmm. um if people haven't had an experience and you're trying to introduce them to it you know there are intellectual activities that are sometimes used by people to understand experience. Mm-hmm. I'm old school again in this way. I believe experience has to be understood experientially. Yeah. So there's a little bit of like an in-service required when you uh, when you want to like really understand experience. Of course, I mean, I, I'll give you a good example. If okay. a person, say a patient comes to see me with um obsessive compulsive disorder Mm -hmm. and it shows up in a phobic way um with uh, avoidance of bridges you know bridges scare me i I have to be in control i I can't 
be vulnerable. It might fall down. Yeah. We can talk about that for a very long time, and it's important to do so. The mm -hmm. familiarity with it, it, you understand its features, blah, blah, blah. But at some point, exposure to the bridge has to happen. Right. Yeah. And and then once they've had the experience, wow, exalted becomes, you know, language, I think, can 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 integrate with the experience in such a way that learning how to talk about, wow, it was scary when I was going over that bridge and halfway yeah. there, I felt like running back, but I didn't let myself. And when I reached the end, I felt stronger than ever before. And I can do it again, but I'm still scared. They they learn how to talk about experience. And that's where language comes in. Yeah. It really helps us cope and understand what we're experiencing, sets us up to have new experiences, but it can't do the work on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. How do you talk about or describe the psychological love life? Because that feels like one of the big foundations of your book. Right, right. That's, I would say the psychological love life is um, a big part of what my contribution is to uh, love life psychology, so yeah. to speak. I'm, I, my belief is that you change your love life uh really change you permanent you can permanently change your love life by understanding what you bring to your love life experience what's yeah. in the psychology um and unfortunately um love is often taught unconsciously it's not taught in classrooms mm -hmm. it's left to the family of origin i identify in my book two experiences that are kind of left to the family of origin which I believe at some future point, we should be teaching something about love and grief. Love and yeah. grief are two Agreed. powerful emotions that is, I think are so intimately related to clinical work and uh, and mental illness. Yes, 50% of my practice are people trying to grieve mm. losses. Right, and losses never having that, been taught how. Absolutely, and they've never, they've been taught bad things like, you know, suck it up or be a man and mm -hmm. men don't cry mm -hmm. or, you know, oh. it'll be overwhelming if you let yourself go into it. These crazy notions yeah. that stop people. And I've had, I've had patients in my office, you know, grieving about losses that happened 30 years ago. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize how much I missed my grandmother. She was a surrogate mom for me yeah. and so important and so on. And being in touch with that at this point and they're the, and they're middle-aged people now and the yeah. loss occurred a long time ago so and love too love is something that obviously if we learn it unconsciously the patterns that are in control if they're healthy everything's beautiful mm -hmm. fine you don't even have to become aware chances are you'll replicate that mm -hmm. uh, if they're unhealthy then we have a problem and so what sits in the psychological love life are uh, these experiences and what we've learned from them mm -hmm. the beliefs the behaviors, the feelings that get recreated over and over again. And once a person becomes aware that they have this psychological love life and they're interested in going inward mm -hmm. to work with it, um, then I introduce the unlearning method. The unlearning yeah. method is a simple three-step method to identify what's in the psychological love life, okay. uh, unlearn it, and learn something better. So uh, the three words, the three steps are identify, challenge, and correct. Great. Uh, identify means to look for repetitive patterns, look for experiences that are being replicated, get some idea of what beliefs, behaviors, and feelings are involved in that learning. Yep. So that's the identif identifying stage. And that consciousness is uh, an empowerment that people now have to apply. Mm -hmm. I mean, the old Freudians had a notion that consciousness alone was really what made changes. Okay, oh, maybe some people knew how to apply it naively. Right, but you're saying you actually have to apply that consciousness. You can't Absolutely. just lean you have into, to, oh, that, now I have it. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's possible to go through a long psychoanalysis, for example, and come out on the other end with a lot of understanding about what happened, but no real change has taken place. So it reminds me, someone just told me, you know, the the a similar story of meditation and awareness where, you know, a monk goes and sits in a cave and learns how to do this 
amazing process where water stays in the bowl when you turn it upside down and then his family uh-huh. came <laughs> yeah. and then right yeah. you know the water <laughs> fell and it's like oh right we we have to be able to take all of this learning and awareness bring it back into our lives where the rubber meets the road otherwise absolutely it absolutely make absolutely a absolutely and in stage 2 it highlights the necessity of that because in stage 2 to begin the unlearning process mm-hmm. you are challenging mm-hmm. what you've learned now, the word challenge, I selected that word because just because you're aware of it, it doesn't go away. No. It's it's habitual. It's got a lot of practice mm-hmm. forming disappointment. It's uh, attached to important members of a family. I mean, taught by mom. You don't give up mom's lessons that easily. Come no, on, apple pie, loyal. you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, the challenge involves being able <clears throat> to identify these early learning experiences as unhealthy, you're tagging them as unhealthy, and you're formulating an understanding that there's a healthier alternative. Mm -hmm. So you're challenging them. You're not allowing them to be automatic. They they like to operate in the dark. They like to operate without choice or permission. But you're challenging. You're disrupting them. And that's what happens to unconscious patterns when we start to mess with them. We start to challenge them. So yeah. that's so a I very remember that somewhere point. in the book you suggested actually doing the opposite. Okay. Now that's stage three. Okay. Stage three. That was correcting. Now that stage three is the correction. Okay. The correction involves, and I love, I love the notion. It, it came to me when I was writing the book that the opposite is intimacy. And the opposite of these unhealthy relationship experiences introduces intimacy, opposite Mm -hmm. of abandonment, commitment, opposite of dishonesty, honesty, opposite of abuse, respect, opposite of neglect, devotion. So if you list all the opposites, I believe, and I, I make the point in the book, and I also make the point in presentations I'm doing now, is that this is what defines intimacy. Yeah. These opposites taken together identify qualities of the intimate relationship. The intimate relationship is the healthiest form of relationship that sustains the emotion of love. In the beginning of this book, in the preface, preface, I make the point, this is not a book about love. This is a book about love relationships. Uh, The relationships we form when we fall in love. Mm-hmm. Love is a mysterious, beautiful, spiritual, unpredictable, uncontrollable phenomena. I hope we never can control it. Yeah. It comes, it goes, it stays. All we can do is form a relationship that nurtures, contains, and supports the growth of that love. And that's, that's what cool. I'm concerned about. That's what yeah. I worry about. That's what I try to teach is that we can do something about the relationships that we form. Yeah. That's what we can learn and unlearn and correct. So setting up the opposite as a correction is important. I, I'll give you a little sense of like in, in a treatment situation, stage two is oftentimes uh, symbolized or, or illustrated by patient comes to see me and says, you know, I went on a date with uh, a guy who is just like all the guys I should stay away from. Mm-hmm. So we'll analyze why. Okay. And okay, this is a dishonest, controlling guy that you shouldn't. Oh, he's like the others. Okay. And then three weeks later, you know, I met a guy who's unfamiliar to me. Yeah. <laughs> that means I don't know how to deal with him. Right. I, I don't, you know, like I. That's I, a good I, point. So, we don't know how to navigate or deal right, with the unfamiliar. Right. The unfamiliar. So, okay. But the good news is you can learn something new. Right. You can learn. So if honesty scares you because you grew up with dishonest people and that's familiar, even though it causes misery. Mm -hmm. Now, let's understand. Let's take a look at let's put it under the microphone, the microscope. What does honesty feel like? What does honesty look like? Let's learn how to identify it, live with it, uh, be honest ourselves when Mm -hmm. someone's honest with you. Face and let's the make honesty the up. correction, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the new experience that you're yeah. learning how to describe and apply. And it's a living through process. It's not just cognitive intellectual understanding. And no, so be. if you're you're there as support mm-hmm. to help the person verbalize this experience of change, 
then it really sticks and it's a beautiful thing to witness. Mm, amazing. Yeah, I was really feeling into that when you said, okay, when we when somebody is familiar to us, we already have those habitual habits and patterns. And so we we come to it with a sense of even if it's miserable, it's often comfortable. Ah, and it's less right. challenging, <laughs> ooh, right? It's ooh, it's less powerful. Yeah. And so the discomfort of, oh my gosh, this isn't familiar from what I've seen and in myself often kicks up this pattern of, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Can I do this? Am I going to be lovable? So, All right. Yeah. Or, or just, just fear of the unknown. Right. I, I had a woman tell me recently, you know, I've been with unavailable men. They're either married or they work too much or mm -hmm. they're not really mm -hmm. into a relationship. They just want sex or... And I, I met a, I met an available man, but I kept thinking he's got to be needy. Or right. There's something wrong. <laughs> or there's something wrong with him. Like, like, you know, it'll, it'll prove to be a problem. I, I don't know how to behave. And oh I, when God. I hear that stuff, mm -hmm. I get excited, yeah. you know, because there's a, there's a little space there for a new learning experience. Yeah. I don't know how to behave. Uh, Good. Yes. Great. Great. Right. Yeah, then you get you to know? discover how to, right. how you actually want to behave versus how you've been conditioned to behave. Absolutely. And what you want could lead you to a healthy love relationship yeah. as a consequence, because now choices are involved. Now consciousness is involved. And you're able to say, no, no, I have to stay away from this type of person. And this is the type of person that I should learn to be with learn to love, learn, learn to, to love, love yes. so that I can have a healthy love relationship that endures. Amazing. Amazing. This is really powerful. And I think it's going to help people make sense of why do I keep choosing these same mm. relationships, these patterns? And, you know, for those of the those men or people listening who are already in relationship, right, this applies too, because we get disappointed in our relationships not we don't always leave them but we can walk around with a sense of like you said res resignation resentment feeling like i'm okay i'm just gonna settle for this settle so, that's no matter, an important word yeah no matter what phase of relationship this is all this is important yeah absolutely thank you so much for this is there anything else you want to leave people with i know again you know in your your decades of work this is just a, a drop in the bucket but what uh, else do you want people well, to know um uh, sometimes people ask me, what's the most important thing to do in your love relationship? And I always say, communicate. Yes. Because communication is an important thing. It can be broken mm -hmm. easily, too easily sometimes. Mm -hmm. And 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 repairing communication is really the basis from which all other things come. Problem solving, yeah. uh, letting people know that you're hurt, uh, letting people know you love them. All the good stuff crosses that bridge, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Um, so I say practice communicating. Be honest about things, right? Yes, sex and why I wrote the book, Honest Sex. <laughs> <laughs> Honesty is a wonderful thing to do yeah. as a communication tool because honesty leads to vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And when, when you are dealing with vulnerability in the field of love, um, then you're open. And that's what vulnerability is. It's an openness. You know, when my, I'll tell you a little story about vulnerability. When when my wife, Victoria, um, moved into my bachelor pad back uh -huh. in 1992, uh, one, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I showed up to my analyst, uh, my session after she moved in, anxious <laughs> on the couch. And my analyst says, What's going on, Tom? I think, well, Victoria moved in. And he goes, I'm confused. Aren't I supposed to congratulate you? Yeah. And I said, but she can hurt me now. Right. She's now in my heart. Yes. Isn't it amazing space. that those experiences you think you would just celebrate bring up that fear, that dread, that, uh -huh. oh, shit. Uh, what, right, right, right. What now? Exactly. Right. And and he said what he's about to say, mm. I'll pass on to you. Love it. And it, it, it shook my tree, so to speak. He said these words. He said, where'd you get the idea, Tom? You could be in love and not get hurt. Mm -hmm. In other words, if there's hurt in love, yeah. we can heal. Ah. 
because that's what it takes. We don't have to avoid the hurt because we can actually heal. Right. Uh -huh. And if you have a faith in your capacity to heal, mm -hmm. then the 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 unintentional hurts of love yes. can be healed. We can learn from them and strengthen our love. Now, intentional love, I'd find the exit as soon as possible. Wait, intentional love, you would find? I'm not, not intentional. I, I didn't mean to say love. Intentional hurt. Right. I, I would find, find the, the exit. exit as soon as possible. Yeah. That's that's a totally different animal. Yeah. But I'm talking about the the disagreements, the the disappoint little disappointments that occur in a love relationship. Yeah. Uh, the misperceptions, all the the little stuff that needs to be healed, the misunderstandings. That's the stuff that I think we can um, heal yeah. and repair and maintain the relationship so that's what i had to learn okay if i get hurt mr analyst uh, <laughs> i can heal it i'll be back tomorrow heal. to talk yeah. about it right yeah. right uh, that's an empowering view okay I, I no longer have to avoid the hurt because uh -huh. i can actually heal i mean this is a really silly example but it reminds me of my kid and i are both learning how to knit and i'm learning again for the second time and i used to feel so anxious about knitting because I knew that if I dropped a stitch, I wouldn't know how to fix it. And I'd have a big hole in my scarf. Right. And it's like, oh, but once I learned how to fix that, I didn't have to carry around that anxiety the whole time I was doing it. Right? Yeah, so really? Know, you can oh, fix I can it. Right, actually right, heal. Right. Excellent. I don't that's have a to wonderful avoid example. That right. Right. And that's the thing. If you don't think you can heal, love is scarier than yes. it needs to be. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Where can people find you and your book? Uh, I have a website called lovelifelearningcenter.com. It's been up okay. since 2012. It's got a lot of information there about, you know, practical issues, love life issues. It has information about my wife and I, numbers to call. We offer love life consultations by phone for people who want to engage in this unlearning method that I'm talking about, but need a little support to, to get it started, to get into it. Uh, clear barriers out of the way so uh, she and i offer that as well and there's numbers on the uh and an email address on the uh on the website to do that i my book is at amazon.com for anybody who's interested in the book great and uh that's that's what i got awesome thank you so much for being here and for living the the vulnerable truth right of your ah, own yes life absolutely and absolutely thank you thank for you. inviting me I'm so glad you joined us for today's episode of Man Alive. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and it gave you something to consider and explore in your life. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful for you to subscribe and write a quick review that helps men like you find us. And again, head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text the word ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 to get a sense of how you can become a better lover and leader. You'll start to see how you can be both more respected and desired in your unique and genuine way. If you don't feel as confident or as excited about life or love as you'd like to be, this quiz is a really great starting point and will guide you toward a more passionate love life and a more inspiring and successful career. So again, text ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 or head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz. Join us each week for a new episode of Man Alive.